privatized and underfunded and attacked publicly funded education before the pandemic arrived. And then, of course, it's gotten so much worse during the pandemic with repeated school closures and a lack of adequate supports coming from Doug Ford and his government to make sure that all of our kids and our frontline education workers are set up for success. And now here we are, uh, more than 20 months into this terrible, terrible ordeal. And tragically, we find ourselves as parents, as Ontarians, back in a very familiar, in a bad way, a very familiar place where schools are scheduled to return in just a few days. And because of months, months and months of underfunding, lack of support, lack of leadership from Doug Ford, when it comes to our kids and the publicly funded education system, we, we, are, we are once again in a position of having a great deal of anxiety about what's supposed to come next or what should come next. Now, you know, I, I experienced it like so many others on this call and around Ontario did, watching my daughters try to grapple with the online learning processes that they had to go through, seeing so much fatigue and burnout from our frontline education workers, and understanding that it didn't have to be this way. Both in the summer of 2020 and again in the summer of 2021, Ontario Liberals put forward thoughtful, responsible, competent plans that had Doug Ford acted on them would have strengthened our publicly funded education system and set all, us, all of us up for success, as I said a second ago. We've talked repeatedly about the need for smaller class sizes and better ventilation in our schools, more supports for kids with special needs and mental health challenges. Uh, all of this and more we've talked about consistently now for well, well over a year. And several weeks ago, several months ago, in fact, I talked about the need to go even a step further, given where we found ourselves back in October and November of this year. We talked about making sure, uh, for example, again, that class sizes uh, be reduced, uh, that we become creative in terms of how we are educating our kids with respect to the physical spaces that they're in. Uh, we talked about the needs for HEPA filters in every classroom across this province, the need for, again, more special needs professionals, mental health professionals in each and every one of our schools. We also talked about the need to make the COVID-19 vaccine universal for kids who are eligible to receive it. I was the first political leader. We were the first political party in Ontario to call for a strong vaccine mandate in both or for both frontline education and healthcare workers. But there's a series of steps that could have been taken, that should have been taken from the very beginning as it relates to our schools. And yet, despite the fact that I have called for this, I believe every other opposition party has called for this, we've seen advocates call for it, and moms and dads across this province have been so desperately wanting to see real leadership what have we gotten from Doug Ford? We've gotten quite the opposite. He's been invisible. He's been invisible over the last few days as we've seen case numbers climbing to numbers that we haven't seen before in this province. No clarity around what's to happen with schools. And as I said, schools are scheduled to reopen in just a few days. Parents are wondering, teachers are wondering, frontline education workers are wondering. And I'm wondering, why is it that consistently when Doug Ford has the opportunity to do the right thing in publicly funded education, he decides to go in the wrong direction. He decides to underfund, to criticize, to attack, and to not embrace the meaningful measures that will help us get through to the other side of this pandemic. And so again today, not for the first time, not for the second time, I think for perhaps the 10th time, I am urging Doug Ford, take a look at the list of six or seven measures that Ontario Liberals are consistently putting forward as it relates to publicly funded ed education. Let's work together on this. Let's get this right. My kids and, and the kids right across this province of ours so need this kind of leadership so that their moms and dads have peace of mind so that we can make sure that we are able to get through COVID-19 to get to the other side of what I know has been a brutally, brutally tough crisis. And then we can work hard together on the kind of recovery that is there to support all of us. So Doug, take a look at our list. It's in our release today, six or seven things from vaccine mandates to help HEPA filters, to smaller class sizes, to a real plan around boosters, to making sure that the rapid testing program is there for yes, our students, but also frontline workers. There's a long list of things that should be done, that should have been done months ago. But as I've always said, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. 
So let's get moving in the right direction. Let's see the kind of leadership that we need, that the kids on this screen today so desperately need, as do their moms and dads. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, a reminder to reporters on the line, if you could please write to the chat with your name and your outlet name, I'll add you to the queue for a question. And the first question is Wyatt Sharp from The Wyatt Sharp Show. Uh, hi, Stephen. Um, I'm just going to ask you uh, about um, the Omicron variant in regards to schools reopening, because obviously we've seen a lot of can change with the Omicron variant, even if you were to look at the case count from, let's say, a month ago, it's obviously very different from the current case count. So uh, given that we don't know, you know, where we'll be in the coming weeks, what would happen if, you know, cases surge even more in uh, the coming weeks? And how can you make sure that if cases do surge again, even more than they currently are in the coming weeks that we can keep schools open? Obviously, you touched on uh, some of the things that you're calling on the Ford government to do right now. But are you confident that if cases were to surge even more, that these measures could still help uh, keep schools open? <clears throat> Yeah, thanks very much for the question, Wyatt. I really appreciate it. I am confident that each of the measures that we have been talking about now for, well, for months, if they were if they were taken in a very genuine way, if Doug Ford made the decision today to actually move in this direction, I am very, very confident that we can make sure that our kids can remain safe uh, while at school, that frontline education workers can remain safe while at school, and that we can get through the balance of this school year in the strongest way possible. What I'm not confident about, sad to say, even though I am urging Doug Ford to do the right thing, what I'm not confident about, given the way that he's behaved since the day he became premier, <clears throat> as, it, excuse me, as it relates to publicly funded education, what I'm not confident about is whether or not he'll do the right thing and make the investments that are necessary. I suppose that we'll, we'll see later today or in the coming days what they announce about this, but, but I wanna be crystal clear about one thing. It is, <clears throat> no longer good enough for Doug Ford to simply say he's done enough, whether it's up to school boards or it's up to public health units or it's up to the federal government or it's up to individual Ontarians to do more. If he says schools are going to reopen on Monday, but he does not take the steps that I've outlined today that Ontario liberals have been calling for for months, then he is taking unnecessary risks with my kids, the kids we see on the screen, Wyatt with you, and with the tens of thousands of other kids that we have across this province, and that's not good enough. This is not the time to be cheap. This is not the time to be missing in action. This is the time to make the investments that are necessary. So if we wanna keep schools open, we know the number one priority, kids have to be safe and our workers have to be safe. The only way to do that is to make the investments and to show the leadership that's necessary to make that happen. <clears throat> Okay, and just as a follow-up, I believe you mentioned earlier about trying to hire more mental health workers uh, in schools. So are you calling on the Ford government to provide additional funding to school boards to hire them or just to hire them independently? Just speak a little bit about the logistics of how that would work. Yeah, for sure. So in the plan that we put out last summer, I think it was last June or July, the Ontario Liberal Plan called for 5,000 new special needs professionals that would, right across the province, that would give us one new, a minimum of one new special needs professional per school that we have in the province. We have about 4,800 publicly funded schools in Ontario. We also called for a thousand new mental health professionals to be added to the roster of existing mental health professionals, again, spread across the province. So between special needs professionals, mental health professionals, our plan from many, many months ago called for about 6,000 new people to be hired I believe the province should be funding that and working closely with the school boards to, to make that a reality. But again, that is work that Doug Ford could have started on back in June or July of this year. Uh, it, you know, This is why I say that it didn't have to come to this. We should not be in a position right now where parents have this much anxiety, where frontline education workers don't know for sure what's happening, where people are so tired, so exhausted, and so burned out from Doug Ford being missing in action. You gotta, when you're in a position of leadership, especially during a crisis, you have to be learning your lessons from what you've experienced earlier in that crisis. And Doug Ford has demonstrated one thing consistently. He stubbornly refuses to learn the important lessons that he should have picked up earlier in this pandemic, in particular as it relates to publicly funded education. Okay, the next question is Steve Pakin from TVO. <clears throat> Let me just unmute you, Steve. 
There we go. Thanks, Will. Uh, Stephen, good morning. Morning. I'm, um, I'm just wondering if we know that the case counts right now are extremely high, relatively speaking. But if we discover that Omicron is not as fatal as the previous strains of this virus have been, and that our ICUs and hospitals are not taxed in a, a more profound way that they have been in the past, would you recommend we take a different approach to handling this crisis? Well, look, I, let, let, let's say uh, that you're correct, that this is something that could take place. We've all seen in the media reports, we've heard from various uh, individual women and men that have expertise. We all hope for the very best. I mean, when, when Omicron was discovered in South Africa in the middle of November, roughly, and then a couple of weeks later here in Ontario, I know it was a real gut punch to most of us here in this province because so many have felt, rightly so, that we've been doing the right thing. So many people getting vaccines, so many people trying their best, uh, to, again, to do the right thing. It was, a real, it was a real punch to the gut to know that we had to start going, I'll say, in the wrong direction. Uh, I think there's there are a lot of questions right now about what the next few weeks are going to look like. But, but let, me, let me just say, going back to what I said to Wyatt, it's so important to learn lessons when you're dealing with a crisis. And if there's one, well, there are many lessons that I think we should have learned, and Doug Ford certainly should have learned since March of 2020. One of them is just the general unpredictability of the public health crisis that we are dealing with. And so that's why I would suggest, and I believe this is what most of the experts, including uh, the science table, and I think public health units uh, and their leaders have been talking about for many, many months, which is you always have to be on guard against the worst case scenario. So for a leader like Doug Ford to just hope for the best and then not prepare for something worse than the best is, is irresponsible and incompetent. And sad to say, that's actually how Doug's ha Doug has handled most of the pandemic, uh, suggesting things are going to be okay and then not backing up uh, those words with the meaningful action that's required to protect all of us. So I want to believe Omicron is not going to be as taxing on our healthcare system as previous variants. We all want that. But as a leader, the responsibility is to prepare for the worst case scenario. And if that doesn't occur, then we're all pleasantly surprised and we go forward. I just, I don't think Doug has learned that lesson at all. I'm tempted to ask as my follow-up whether or not it constitutes a form of child abuse to force all of your candidates to have their kids on a political Zoom uh, for a press conference, but that will not be my follow-up. My follow-up is, uh, so you do, you do not believe then that we are close to a point where this thing is endemic and we are just going to have to learn to live with it forever? Well, I, look, again, I, I think, I don't know of a single Ontarian who doesn't want to be in a position where uh, you know, this becomes, as they say, endemic rather than a pandemic. I think that we are all looking for that kind of evolution. But for 20 to 21 months, whatever it's been now, every single jurisdiction, every single leader who has underestimated the unpredictability of COVID-19 has done so at great risk to the people they're supposed to represent. So as much as I want to believe, and I think everyone on this call and everyone in Ontario wants to believe that we are so much closer to the end of this crisis, the end of this ordeal, um, we, we, as people in positions of leadership, can't presume that we are there until we know for sure, until the science backs up that we are there. In the meantime, whether it's boosters, whether it's supporting vulnerable seniors and protecting them, what we are talking about today regarding our schools, uh, the vaccine rollout, the rapid, uh, the rapid antigen testing, the PCR tests that people in this province can't get for days and days and days right now, all of those things need to be worked on right now uh, so that when we get to the point where it is endemic, where we are, we are through the worst of this crisis, uh, we, we can go forward and recover. But I don't think we're there yet. I hope we're there soon. I just don't think we're there yet. And if we are there or if we were almost there, it's still the responsible thing for a premier like Doug Ford to prepare for the worst and guard against the worst risks. And he's not doing that right now. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, a reminder to reporters on the line to please uh, write your name and outlet name to the chat and I'll have to do the queue. The next question is Holly McKenzie Sutter from CP. Hi, Stephen. I uh, was looking through your uh, um, news release from today and it does list a lot of things that should have been done or could have been done to keep schools open, but I'm wondering what you think about, um, you know, the situation right now, given we don't know 
really the accurate number of cases. We're talking about opening schools in less than a week. Do yeah. you think that schools should be delayed for a week like some other provinces are doing? Like, do you feel that it's um, safe or appropriate to actually have in-person learning on Monday? Yeah, this is it's a it's such an important question and an issue that you're raising, Holly. And it's such a, you know, it's something that I think every mom and dad in this province really wrestles with or is grappling with right now. Uh, my wife and I have spoken about it. Um, watching what our daughters went through, and I'm quite certain it's probably true for every one of our candidates on this call and tens of thousands of other families across this province, watching what our kids went through with online learning and the back and forth throughout the last the last number of months, the last couple of years, it was uh, it was incredibly punishing on a lot of our kids, a lot of our kids. And I think that there, I don't know of a mom or a dad who in ideal circumstances wouldn't want their kid back in school. We all do, but we also have an overarching responsibility to our children to make sure that they are safe and protected at all times. The same thing holds for every one of our frontline education workers. And so, you know, I think right now, two things need to occur. One is the very best medical and scientific advice should be relied upon at this moment in time. And secondly, because I've been doing um, media conferences for well over a year now talking about publicly funded education. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm picking on reporters. I'm not. But at every single one of my media availabilities or media conferences, I have been asked a very similar question. Yes, it's true, Doug Ford should have done things months ago, but he didn't. What should he do right now? The problem is that this is this keeps on happening. And we just kind of, I don't think parents have accepted it, but I think it's almost like the expectations of leadership, the expectations of Doug Ford have dropped so low that people just kind of throw up their hands and say, oh my goodness, this is the, I guess this is the best we have for now. But what I'm here today as an opposition party leader to say is this is not the best that we should have working for us. It's to me, it's no longer good enough to say, what's the de decision going to be right now, right today? And then don't worry about it, Del Duca. We'll just, we'll, we'll push all those other ideas under the rug until the next crisis. What I'm here to say is take the, Doug should be taking the very best medical and scientific advice right now about what to do come Monday. He should be talking to moms and dads and frontline education workers in a genuine way to hear how they feel about where they find themselves right now. And then he should make an ironclad commitment to the people of Ontario to, to wake up and actually start funding publicly funded education properly and shrink our class sizes and give us better ventilation and make sure that our kids, many of whom are dealing with horrible, horrible learning difficulties because of this pandemic, Give, are given the chance to catch up and recover. I mean, th th these are the th things that are so so fundamental and so essential. And yet Doug, Doug keeps pretending like they're not his job. They are his job. They are the premier of Ontario's job. And Doug Ford doesn't seem to understand that. Right. I understand what you're saying, but we do have to hear a decision from him in a couple of days. And that's kind of where you know, teachers, parents are having all this uncertainty. So I'm just wondering what the Liberal Party position is. Like, should schools be open or closed on Monday? We've seen some provinces say, um, it's too uncertain right now, let's give it another week. Like, is that something appropriate? And I guess if um, you don't want to answer that, like, what are you planning to do with your kids? Are they going to be going to class on Monday or would you um, prefer that they stay home? It, you know, look, it's it's not a question of not wanting to answer it. I, I think, again, I'm just going to repeat what I said a second ago. I think the most important thing Doug can do right now, any leader could do, is listen to what the science table is saying, listen to what the chief medical officer of health is saying, take that advice. I, it, you know, It's not too late for Doug to reach out and talk to moms and dads and talk to frontline education workers, have some real conversations over the next 24 hours, 48 hours. I'm sure his, his staff can arrange that for him, but I mean real conversations. For him to personally gauge the angst and the anxiety uh, that everybody is feeling. If that ultimately means that we have to delay the reopening of schools by a few days or a week or two, then I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but here's the most important thing. It will be an epic failure. I mean, a failure of epic proportions for Doug Ford to simply say, we're going to delay schools by a day or a week or two weeks or a month, and then do nothing else to make the schools better and safer for our kids and our workers. And that's, that's what I'm driving at with everything I've said today. 
you know, saying I'm going to close the schools or leave them closed for a little while longer, as much as that's going to make life so, so difficult for so many families, including kids who really should be in school, we all want kids to be in school as long as they're safe. But delaying it and doing nothing is an absolute epic, epic fail. And that's what Doug has done repeatedly during the pandemic every time there's been a closure. So what I'm saying is, get the best advice. If you have to delay the reopening of schools, do it based on that best advice. But in the time that you are given, while those schools remain closed to in-person learning, make the investments and show the leadership to make sure we don't end up here again, to make sure that our kids are set up for success, to make sure that our frontline education workers are safe. These are the things that are that are the responsibility of a premier, and they're things that Doug Ford has consistently deserved to get a failing grade for. Okay, the next question on the line is from Ahmad Al Bayoumi from News Beyond. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for taking my question. I hope you're well. Um, yeah. So, at the start of the month, Dr. Moore told reporters that the province isn't considering extending the winter break. He said specifically that he had spoken with experts, and they see they see no reason to to you know close schools to ex extend the break. Um, so, what would you have done differently if you were in government right now? Um, specifically, and I know that you've spoken on different measures that you'd like to take, but specifically when it comes to what health officials are saying, we've heard health officials say from the science table that maybe a circuit breaker is needed, but we have the province's top doctor saying, "Hey." experts are telling us otherwise. And would you support the province providing local health officials the power to close schools as necessary? We've seen regions like Toronto and Peel do that at the start of the year when Delta was fueling the third wave. Yeah, it's a, it, listen, thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. I just, you know, I want to call everyone's attention to the fact that um, back in the middle of November, I think it was November the 15th, if I'm not mistaken, so this would have been, I believe, prior to Dr. Moore saying what you said a second ago, it was prior to Omicron being discovered in South Africa, certainly prior to Omicron being discovered here in Ontario. I, I spoke to media and we put out a release as a party. I'm sure it's still on our website. If not, Will from my office would be happy to circulate it to media. So back on November the 15th, we went out with a series of ideas. This is before Omicron. We went out with a series of ideas, both that would have helped with with respect to schools and what's happening in publicly funded education, but also just generally speaking, what have helped Ontarians deal with case numbers that we always knew, even, uh, even um, without Omicron, we're going to start to go in the wrong direction because we have cold weather in Ontario. People start to congregate indoors in larger numbers. So Dr. Moore said, I think it was September, we know case numbers are going to start to go in the wrong direction. That's why in the middle of November, I put out a series of things around boosters and vaccine mandates and the vaccine certificate and, and other items, better ventilation in all indoor settings, where we said to Doug Ford at that point in time, here are five or six fairly straightforward things you can do right now that will help Ontario deal with what's coming. And then Omicron landed and weeks went by and there was no serious reaction or action or leadership from Doug Ford. And then suddenly, just before the Christmas holidays, the numbers skyrocketed, which, by the way, everybody, everybody with expertise predicted would happen. The numbers skyrocketed, then Doug Ford is scrambling, and here we find ourselves four days or so out from the scheduled return of school, wondering what the decision is going to be. How many times, how many times do we have to see the same bad movie and all, you know, sequel after sequel from Doug Ford before we realize? He's just not up to the job. He's just not responsible. He is not competent. He, he doesn't understand what his job is because this keeps happening. And so, you know, I, I said earlier that we all hope we are much closer to the end of this horrible, horrible crisis than we are at the beginning. And I believe we are closer to the end. But I am, I am personally, forget politics, I am personally, as an Ontarian, just fed up with watching Doug Ford irresponsibly and incompetently continue to put people in this province at risk for no good reason. So there were steps he could have taken back in November. There are steps he could be taking right now, whether it's schools or it's general society, that he should be doing, and yet he refuses to do it. Doug Ford seems to be the only person in this province who doesn't realize that he's got a responsibility to step up and give us real leadership. 
All right, thank you. Um, forgive me for you know sliding away from the topic of this press no, conference. No. I do want to ask you about um, yesterday. Dr. Moore was scheduled to make an announcement um, on uh, contact tracing and case management. No. His announcement was postponed um, before the press conference started. No. Um, the, the Ministry of Health said that um, he and Public Health Ontario are evaluating guidance against Ontario-specific evidence um, when it comes to isolation and quarantine period a day after the CDC shortened that period. Um, so what is your reaction to that? And, and specifically on the Omicron variant, what can the province be doing differently right now, not a week ago, but right now um, to change the current trajectory in cases and stop the growth of, or and stop the spread of the variant? But, okay, great question, but it's the same steps. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's no, there's nothing, in, in many respects, there's, there's nothing new today that we shouldn't have done in November or December or earlier in December. It's all the same stuff, right? So making sure that N95 masks are available, for example, to kids and frontline education workers, making sure that COVID-19 vaccines are universal for kids who are eligible to receive them in all of our schools. And using the schools, by the way, as vaccine, uh, as vaccine hubs. I mean, that's what I called for many, many months ago, a real vaccine mandate. Um, you know, I, long before Doug Ford did it, I said that we should transition away from uh, the vaccine certificate being in multiple formats and have it be exclusively a QR code. Now, I've said this previously on the record. I'll repeat it again today. I, I think it's horribly confusing to the people of Ontario to say you can't have any more than 10 people for a social event indoors, for example, at your home, but 9,000 plus people can go watch a Leafs game or a Raptors game. That doesn't make sense to the people of Ontario. I'm not sure that it's wise to have that many individuals congregating in a newer settings uh, at this point in time. There's a series of things, but these things are not new. The, these things were, in, many of them were included in the release that we put out November 15th. They are, they have, and I, this is not me trying to look for glory, by the way. I don't think I'm the only opposition leader who's been calling for this or a member of the science table or activist or you know, people that we have out there, people have repeatedly be calling for real leadership from Doug Ford for month after month after month. And yet here we are back in the same horrible mess where the numbers are really scary this time around, where people don't know what to do. And so there's, there's no, there's no uh, groundbreaking magical solution. We just need Doug Ford to give us real, responsible, competent leadership on all of the things that I've highlighted today. And if he started that work right now, and he marshaled all of the resources that a provincial government with a majority in the legislature and a premier leading that provincial government, if he was prepared to do that work right now and stop being missing in action and stop cheaping out on our schools and our kids, then I think we'd be in the strongest position possible. I fear he won't do that, but I am sincerely hopeful that he will. Okay, uh, there's no other questions on the line, but I see Steve Pakin would like to get one more in. So Steve, go ahead. Thanks, Will. Uh, uh, Stephen, I don't know which of your candidates could answer this question. So if you like, pick one or two, but I, I am interested in how comfortable the people represented here today on this call are in sending their children back to school next week. Well, you know, I'll I'll go first, and then I'll I'll uh, perhaps ask Jill Hermoli if she wants to uh, share her thoughts as well. Uh, I mean, any of our candidates could speak about it, but I'm I'm going to ask Jill to go. Just I, I think, you know, I think that, you know, it's really it's a real tough it's a real tough consideration for for us here in our household. My older daughter is in grade nine, so she's in high school. Our younger daughter is in grade five. I will say that I think last year's school experience was tough on both of our daughters, but particularly tough on our younger daughter. I think in a grade four class as she was last year, it was really hard for her and her schoolmates and certainly for her teacher to keep the attention of the kids and to make sure that they were they were following along and learning. And I, looking at the kids I can see on my screen today who are even younger than my younger daughter, I, I imagine that it was really, really tough all the way through. So again, as I said earlier in this conversation, with everything, with every fiber of my being, I want my daughters to be back in school on Monday. This is me talking personally. But I also want to make sure that there's no more confusion or unease about how safe they are. Now, my older daughter has both doses of the vaccine. Our younger daughter's got her first dose, hoping to book her second dose relatively soon. So we are, you know, we want to make sure the masks that they have that they take to school are the best masks available that we can access. 
we are, you know, we tell them, we give them advice about how to behave around their friends at school. We're like, we're doing our very best to set our kids up for success. And my family is a relatively privileged family. There are tens of thousands of families across this province that don't have what, what we have here, sadly, that don't have here, uh, don't have in their lives what we have here in this household. And I shudder to think about how horribly difficult this must be for them. And it just, so, you know, I want my kids to be back on Monday, but I'm going to be listening really, we, my wife and I are going to be listening really closely over the next day or two uh, to hear what Dr. Moore says, if the science table weighs in again, to hear what Doug Ford says. And we're going to make a game time decision over the weekend about what to do on Monday if it's left to us as an option. Uh, I'm, I just, before I hand it over to Jill, I also want to say I'm really concerned, even though I do support local decision making, and I know our public health units have done incredible work over the past 20, 21 months. One of my biggest concerns right now, because I'm fearful that Doug doesn't really want to make a decision. You know, I'll, I'll share this. I think he's scared to make a decision here because he's nervous about alienating uh, for the sake of politics this close to an election. He's nervous about alienating people and turning off voters. And that's completely the wrong way to lead. So I'm nervous that he's going to pass the buck to school boards or individual public health units. I hope I'm wrong about that. I hope that there will be a clear decision made that's backed up by the science. But most importantly, as I said, in response to an earlier question, whatever the decision is, it, it can't be one and done. It can't be, here's the decision about Monday. Now everybody ignore what's happening in our schools. It's got to be, here's the decision about Monday based on the best advice that he's getting from the science table and the chief medical officer of health. And oh, by the way, he's also going to invest in smaller class sizes, better ventilation, boosters, uh, rapid testing, supporting our workers, special needs professionals, mental health professionals, better, you know, all of it. He's got to do both. Jill, why don't you jump in and talk a little bit about what's happening in your family as well? Thanks so much, Stephen. And Steve, thanks so much for the question too. Um, this has been a really tough conversation in our household. I, I sent my kids out of the room for this one. Um, we've already lost one of our children to a school flu outbreak. So this is something that we've been dealing with for the last five years. And um, during the pandemic, it's been a question that we've had to navigate over and over again and, and just constantly um, recalculating what our risk is, especially here in Peel region where we've been hit so hard by this and where we've constantly dealt with um, classroom closures and, uh, and exposure and, and not really knowing what's going to be happening from one day to the next. Um, right now we're seeing just, you know, cases beyond what we should be imagining at this point. And we know that Omicron is, it's a, it's a new challenge that we couldn't have guessed would be coming. Uh, and we really don't know what sort of numbers we're actually dealing with because we know that people are unable to get tested at this point. Um, we know that uh, rapid tests aren't necessarily detecting what people actually are facing. Uh, I, I know personally, um, more people than I can count on my hands, people who have been testing negative on rapid tests and then getting positive PCR results back. Uh, but people are unable to get PCR tests. Um, I know we have been isolating through the holidays because we had a classroom exposure and we still today don't have those results back. Um, so we don't, we actually don't know what we're sending our kids back into, but I know a lot of people who've been, um, you know, dealing with exposures already prior to the holidays, through the holidays, people who gathered and still aren't quite sure whether or not they are sick. Um, every single day, more and more people who I know personally are, are sick with COVID. And um, this is more than I have known throughout the pandemic to date. Um, so for us, it is, it's a really big challenge to know what to do on Monday. Our kids are both uh, in that five to 11 range. So they have had their first dose at this point. We have moved up our, our you know, their second doses based on, um, based on our own choices after hearing different positions on that, uh, but they won't have their second dose before Monday. And we don't, we don't know what they're going to be facing. We don't know how many people are going to be uh, able to access tests, uh, how many people are going to be sick in their classrooms. Here in Peel, we're hovering around 30% uh, vaccine uptake in the five to 11 range. And a lot of people are not able to access vaccines in our region at this point. So, um, I really want to hear that there's going to be testing capacity, that people are going to be able to access tests as they need them, uh, that we're going to be seeing an you know, improvement in vaccine capacity in our region, because right now we know that not enough people in that 5 to 11 range are able to get vaccines. Uh, not enough people are able to get boosters to be able to protect that age group either, um, because if those kids are not getting vaccinated, then they're coming back home to family members who are also not uh, having their third doses. So there's a lot to be considering. Um, you know, in, in our region, but right across the province where people are uh, not as protected as we need them to be. 
people are not able to access testing. We know that uh, ventilation is not where it needs to be. We know that people are not able to often access the type of masks that they need. They have been recommending that we all move to N95s. Um, we've fortunately been able to access N95s for our kids, um, but a lot of families can't do that. They haven't been able to find them or they can't afford them. These are things that we need to ensure that every Ontarian has access to if we're going to be sending them back into a higher risk environment. And right now we're not seeing that done. And then one more thing, this is something I've talked about for the last five years. We need to make sure that we're helping people feel confident in their decision to vaccinate. And we are not seeing enough of that work done right now. You know, when we take a look at those numbers and we know that a lot of those kids in that five to 11 age group have not yet received their first dose, that should be giving us alarm bells. And we know that vaccine hesitancy has been an issue in Ontario and it's been a growing problem for years. When we see how many kids have not yet had that first dose, we know that we need to be acting on that urgently. And so that's that's a big job that we need to be taking on right now. And if we're going to be sending kids back, we need to be making sure we're getting as many vaccinated as quickly as possible. Okay. And there are no other questions on the line. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.